Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And I hope you're all doing really well. Thank you very much for joining this Arup Climate Change Recruitment event. My name is Ben Smith. I'm a director working for Arup based in London, and I lead projects that have a climate focus, working with a range of our clients and partners. And the clients I tend to work with are typically city administrations, local authorities or developers, and my experience spans sustainable development and both greenhouse gas emissions reduction and climate change adaptation and resilience. But across Arup and in all our teams and in all locations, we're seeing a growing demand from our clients to support them in delivering net zero and enhancing their climate resilience. And of course, this is not only within Arup. The urgency to act on climate change is increasing. A lot of our clients are making bold commitments and the demand for our consulting services is growing rapidly. We want to try and keep up with that demand if we can, not least because we think work in this space perfectly aligns to Arup's mission statement to shape a better world. We are, we are though in a really heavily competitive job, jobs market. And so we're actively thinking about what we can do to make ourselves stand out, to attract the best, highest quality and most diverse talent into our organization. So that's the reason why we're having this chat tonight. Um, events like this are not something that we've done in the past, uh, but we figured that by just allowing a few of our people to talk in a forum like this, you'd get a sense of what it's like to work at Arup. And you never know, it might inspire you to apply by yourself. So in terms of the format for this evening, it's going to be really straightforward. Um, just, a, just a chat really, just a, a classic panel discussion. I'm going to chair that. Uh, we've assembled a great panel, some of colleagues that are going to introduce themselves in just a moment. Uh, and we just hope that through that conversation, I've got a few questions that, that you'll get a bit of a sense of what it's like to work at Arup. And we'd love to take some questions from you at the end as well. So please have a think about questions that you might like to ask and post them so that we can see and respond later on in the session. So introductions to the panelists first then. Um, and guys, when you're introducing yourself, maybe you can just say along with your name and a bit of background about yourself, uh, one thing that you enjoy about working here at Arup. And uh, Tim, I'll start with you if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, my name's Tim. I'm a planning and sustainability consultant. I am uh, currently sat in a hopefully quiet corner uh, of the Manchester office. Um, and here's where I've yeah, I spent my uh, whole time at Arab. So I initially started here uh, as an intern. So between my third and fourth year at the University of Manchester, uh, where I studied a integrated master's in town and country planning, um, I got accepted for a placement at Arab. And so I worked there over the summer and they asked me if I could do uh, just like one day a week in my final year of uni. Uh, so I said, yeah, of course. Um, and over my last year, I over that last year of uh, university, I was working in the Arab office. So I was getting a lot of experience, which helped me uh, in my degree, which is great. Um, and then I applied for the grad scheme and I was successful. So I joined full time in September 2019. Uh, so I joined in the planning team in Manchester uh, and I've sort of jumped about a bit uh, since starting uh, in the planning team in Manchester, which I still sit in. I have had secondments to the uh, rail team working on an infrastructure project in the Northwest, uh, trans and route upgrade. Um, I've also been seconded to the UK IMEA, so that's the UK, India, Middle East and Africa uh, climate services team, uh, where I actually worked under BEM. Um, and most recently, I am now sitting in the regenerative land management team. So that's uh, trying to deploy sustainable uh, land management practices like nature-based solutions, um, blue-green infrastructure interventions, those sort of things. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a bit about my journey at Arab. So I've, I've been uh, fortunate to jump about a bit and sort of experience different parts of the company, work with a lot of different people. Uh, so I, I think to your second question, Ben, about what I enjoy about working here, it would probably be that degree of flexibility. So being able to uh, being, being given the opportunity to sort of jump about and see what I what I have enjoyed and and what I would like to pursue in future. So, yeah, I, I think that that's that's really it. Is is I feel like you're very much given the opportunity to go down an avenue and carve a path that you um, that you want to. And there's all sorts of uh, things that you can you can do to do this. There's like internal research funds that you can apply to if you're very in, interested in pursuing a certain topic. Um, People are always very willing to help, especially in the climate space. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's probably what I would say is the flexibility that it has afforded me. Thanks, Tim. That's brilliant. And I, yeah, I know that you're hoping one day to get a transfer down to South Africa. So maybe we can make that <laughs> so, yeah. a reality. Ayesha, I'll ask the same question to you if that's OK. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So hi, everyone. I'm Aisha. I'm really, really excited uh, to be a panelist today and to um, and to be here. So uh, I've worked at Arup for just over five years now. Um, so I currently work in the Infrastructure London group where I've spent the majority of my uh, career working on infrastructure master planning projects, which mainly encompass things like um, working with flood risk, drainage design, utility coordination uh, and public realm design. So the easiest way that I like to think of what I do is essentially designing everything that's outside of a building, but not the building itself. Um, and so in terms going going backwards, so in terms of my academic background, I joined Arup after having graduated from UCL in London uh, in environmental engineering. And so my interest ver from very early on has been in environment and sustainability, uh, renewable energy um, and water. And so I feel like the team I sit within Arup does really, really meet that criteria quite well. Um, so if I had to choose one specific thing about uh, what I like working at Arup, uh, it's that I, I genuinely feel like I've been um, encouraged to follow my interests and, and my goals. So just as an example, um, Arabs have provided me with support throughout my career in terms of my chartership. Uh, they funded my professional mem membership subscription at the ICE. Um, also, I've had the opportunity to work on site at Euston for a year working on the enabling works uh, construction of High Speed 2 uh, when I expressed interest in working on site specifically. And then more recently, quite similar to Tim, actually, I've started to get more involved in climate mitigation, uh, regenerative land management, which for me is a complete new area. And I feel like Arup have fully supported that transition. Thanks, Aisha. That's that's fantastic. And, and Lewis, I'll come straight to you if that's all right. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. It's it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Luis. A bit about me. I am Brazilian. Uh, I'm actually working from here in Brazil at the moment, which is great. Going back to the UK soon, where I'm based in London. Uh, since 2017, uh, I currently am a senior civil engineer. So, but my I joined Air, well, a long time ago in 2014. Uh, I did a summer internship in the New York office. So that was my first experience with Arab, but then I joined back in 2017 in London. So just from that, you get a bit of understanding of how Arab is great in terms of this flexibility, getting to work from different places and you know shaping the way your career, the way you want, which is great. Um, a bit about me, I think, um, yeah, I'm in the same team as Aisha. Uh, so my core skills are in the master planning area, urban development and regeneration schemes. So I work with clients, to develop uh, places, cities, neighborhoods with pioneering sustainability targets, objectives. So that's where my core, my, my core skills are. But I'm also really heavily involved in, in the adaptation side, so climate resilient projects. So basically improve the resilience of infrastructure systems, ma mainly transport water. Uh, and build environment to basically adapt to a changing climate. And from the mitigation point of view, I also am leading um, several initiatives to basically uh, implement carbon management in infrastructure projects. So that comes from internally upskilling our teams, developing tools, developing training, to also influencing climate clients to, to embed carbon management uh, into their projects and organizations. So if I could mention one thing I enjoy about Arab is the culture. So um, I think benefits, nice projects you can find in many places, but a culture, a culture is not that easy to develop. It's embedded into the core values, the mission of the company. And I think this people-centric centric culture of Arab is unique. Um, you get to meet amazing, brilliant people, but at the same time, they celebrate the differences in the different things you bring, your background, your culture, your, your, if you're a generalist or if you're a specialist, um, there's always a place for you. So I think that's a, the greatest thing about working here. Thanks, Lewis. Um, and really enjoying your passion as well in terms of how you're getting across what it's like to be um, here at Arab. And I guess, you know, just to answer, I suppose, my own question with my own uh, thoughts and perspectives, I think the thing that I, so different to you, I have not spent my whole career in Arab. I joined uh, four, four years ago, but maybe you can tell from the grey hairs, had worked elsewhere before. Um, but what I really like is the fact that it's not, we're not always just thinking about work that we deliver for our, our clients. And that is obviously our, still our primary 
uh, concern. But often we learn stuff on our projects with our partners and clients, and we think, well, actually, how can we build and develop that further to make it something that's you know more useful for that client and others like them? And we have a system internally where we're able to apply for funds to take forward projects of our own uh, that we can uh, work on together internally or with partners from outside of ARA as well. And I just I just think it's a fantastic um, a function, process, a set of tools that if people who are in the organization have an idea and they, they can win support for their idea, then they can essentially be funded to take that forward. And it, and it does, um, I think, result in some great outputs. And, um, you know, as you were saying, Lewis, you know, it really sort of, feeds into that culture of innovation and creativity. So that would be my thing. And I think it's quite unique, actually, uh, within this firm compared with others um, in this industry. So uh, that's one thing that I've enjoyed uh, since being at Arup for the last sort of four, four or so years. OK, um, so just going to go on to the next question then. I just want to get a sense from each of you about the people that you work with. Um, you know, I don't know if you're going to talk about individuals. If you do, don't name them. But just, um, you know, tell us a little bit about what you enjoy about some of your colleagues uh, on project teams or just in the teams that you work in. And um, we'll go in the backwards order. So we'll go Lewis first, if that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. So I think the people I work with, so first internally, um, they're really, really bright minds. Um, but the, the, the one of the key things I like about Arab is one is truly collaborative. So it, the people are extremely collaborative and open, you know, to collaborate and, you know, bring different minds, different expertise, expertise together, regardless of the size of the project. So that's a, a really interesting people, thing about people here. They're super collaborative and it's a truly global organization. We don't only sit in different offices, but we collaborate and we come together as a company in different projects. And you can always find local expertise in, in different areas, different geographies, regardless of where your project is. So that's a really interesting people. You can find people from everywhere. It's a really diverse company. And that's really important to me because, yeah, coming from a different background, it's always good to, you know, looking in the room and finding people that you can relate to. So that's a, a really great thing about Arab. And then it's externally, I think most of you all know how Arab leads with leading people in the industry. Like I personally, you know, get involved with, uh, get in touch with architects, leading architects in the industry, landscape architects, developers. And we have a range of great partners like C40, Resilient Shift, World Bank, and Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So they're really the thought leaders in this in this realm of climate, the climate agenda. So I think it's really inspiring to work with those people. Um, yeah, that's all I, I can say for now, I think. No, that's great, Lewis. Thank you. And Aisha, uh, same question. Yeah, sure. Given that I work with Luis, I'm quite happy with her answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite nice to hear. So, yeah, I completely agree with, with what Luis was saying. So I, I, again, am very fortunate to be able to collaborate with Arab colleagues all over the world on a lot of projects I've worked on. And so despite myself being based in the London office, I completely agree with Luis. My day-to-day -day work involves with speaking to colleagues in various offices around the, the Arab world. And so what I personally value from that is the global insights I'm able to gain from all those conversations I'm having all the time. And then more locally in, in, in terms of my specific team and those who I see daily, I would say that, um, <clears throat> that most people are quite open to help. Um, they're genuine problem solvers, uh, you know, m most of them being engineers, so they would be. And they always have a solution to any problem I'm facing. So I feel certain that if I don't know the answer to something or if I'm faced with something that's particularly challenging, it's really comforting to know that at least one person in my team has probably faced the same problem and is going to be able to give me that practical advice. And even uh, looking back in, in, in the times of COVID, pandemic started, I remember I was seconded uh, at the time to a contractor um, at HS2. So I was not only, you know, physically, but also work-wise quite separate from, from my team. Um, but I, I specifically remember during that time, uh, Arab and specifically my, my colleagues made an effort to check in with myself and, and with each other. And we had kind of weekly calls and they made me feel like I wasn't stranded or forgotten, left on site, which was really nice and sweet of them. So yeah, I think both global and local, I think, is um, the culture is really important. I agree completely. Uh, Tim, what, what, what are your thoughts on this one? Sure, yeah. Um, I think I can only really sort of add to what um, Aisha and Louise have already said. Um, 
it would probably be the approachability of everybody. So I, uh, I've had a bit of a different role where I've not been, uh, my role has been a bit more internally faced in terms of climate. Um, so it's sort of trying to help uh, promote climate, um, you know, sort of join the dots within Arab uh, between all the different climate teams. Um, and sort of related to what Aisha just mentioned, uh, there's like the calls, uh, the calls that we have uh, weekly with like the sort of, uh, people within each region within the UK and also uh, further afield in, in Africa and the Middle East um, just to sort of talk about the sort of climate agenda sort of the things that people are working on if anybody can uh, help each other out I think that those are very engaging and they're always you know very uh, very friendly and people um, you know very keen to like give their inputs so I think that's a that's very uh, refreshing to see but yeah it's probably approachability because uh, over the last year well I've, I've actually been uh, been uh, working with you Ben but um, over the last year I've been working sort of with the more senior people in Arab um, trying to help them you know with the with the progression of climate uh, within the company and the, everybody's very you know open to hearing ideas and I think that's also helped by the fact that everybody understands the uh, you know the sort of urgency of the climate uh, agenda so everybody's very keen to you know help out and uh, and uh, offer their support. So yeah, I can only really echo what uh, Aisha and Louise have said, but uh, I guess it'd be quite useful to hear your perspective, Ben. Uh, <laughs> similar to Aisha, I will be, I will be uh, listening to hear what you say, seeing as we haven't worked together before. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, <laughs> it's fine. And I, I think you, I agree with everything that you've all said. Um, and I think I'd answer the question in two ways. One, it's incredible to have such a massive global network of people who are specialists in so many different fields who are genuinely genuinely and always prepared to sort of take your call listen to your challenge and then give you support so that's kind of at one level one end of the spectrum i suppose but i guess just reflecting on the last couple of years and the change that's happened for all of us like you know working in our shed in our garden or wherever else you are it's really been those consistent weekly calls with the same faces that have been like a really uh, great source of um, energy for me, you know, and uh, you know, checking in with you, Tim, but also the rest of the crew on the Wednesday morning calls that we have. Just uh, we have a, a weekly call which is talking about the opportunities that we're seeing in the market for bidding for new work in the climate space, uh, where we all share ideas about, you know, how how we can go about uh, responding to those tenders, how we can deliver those projects, which are the right people to work on the right on those projects, and so on. And, and the continuity of the of those uh, fixed time every week, same group of people get to know each other. Um, it's been it's been really nice actually over the last couple of years, especially. Um, life, I guess, has changed for all of us. Although we're starting to get back into the office now, and I'm really looking forward. Where I work in London, we're opening a new office, which is looking like it's going to be very smart. Just in the next couple of weeks, I'm really kind of looking forward to getting back and getting in there and and seeing everyone. Uh, but no, generally agree with all the points you've made, and. Um, so I, I suppose um, it sort of leads us on to the next question, really, um, you know, in a sort of similar theme, really, just so we can have a bit of a chat about what life is like here. I mean, Aisha, what, what's, what's your sort of motivating force um, for working in Arab, but specifically wanting to focus on the climate work, as, you, as I know you do? <clears throat> yeah, so I think, like I said, my, you know, I have that background uh, academically in the environmental sphere. So that's always kind of been a consistent thing. Um, in my life and even you know in my career so um, yeah besides the fact that I'm quite interested in environmental issues uh, in my day-to-day -day life I think what I, I would say renew renewed or reignited my motivation was uh, the amount of presence that Arup had at COP26 which was, ama it was an amazing time to, to be at Arup and see all the internal comms and external and seeing everybody that was there um, and also just the commitments we made at COP with our projects moving forward was just really fantastic to see and really kind of renewed that motivation. And I do feel like now more than ever, uh, sustainability and climate issues are not solely the responsibility of one team or, you know, whereby it's a tick box exercise or it's just, you know, a BRIAM assessment, like, you know, potentially that it had that impression back, back in the day. I do think more recently there's been a fundamental mind shift where, we're delivering climate solutions within every team and every sector. I try and draw my motivation from that, um, on the fact that we're all working towards the same goal, we're all on the same page, and um, we have the same agenda. Um, and also looking forward, I'm, I think I'm more motivated by the new projects and potentially clients that that we can we can start working with. So um, you know, as I've mentioned before, we do get to work with a, a lot of global. Um, 
global Arab offices around the world. So being an international firm with many countries around the world, I do think for me personally, it would be great for my my personal career and future if I were to be able to take uh, an international assignment maybe to another Arab office and experience that life working abroad um, and having those connections that I talked about earlier, those global Arab connections makes it that much easier to seek those international opportunities, which might not be the case with, you know, a, a smaller firm. So I think that's definitely a big uh, motivator for me to work in the climate division here at Arab. Thanks a lot. That's great. And yeah, hopefully those opportunities will come to pass. Um, Tim, I'll, I'll come to you next. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, well, uh, Aisha, what you just mentioned about COP, so I was actually lucky enough uh, to attend COP and um, Arab, uh, supported me uh, to do that. They let me uh, take the time off to go to go um, do it and, you know, they uh, reimbursed me. So that was that was great. And uh, uh went to go see the uh, stand that we'd put up there on the virtual cities. Uh, maybe, maybe Ben, you, uh, you wanted to say a bit about that. But in terms of what uh, motivates me about working in Arab, so in the, in the climate division, I think, yeah, also echoing what Aisha said, what we're seeing is it's just becoming a lot more uh, present in everybody's mind. So, you know, it's it's becoming more uh, prominent in like the bids that we see, you know, the, the uh, clients that are attending for it, which means that the range of projects that you can work on is just growing and growing. Uh, so whereas before it may have just been strictly like, you know, uh, a net zero strategy, now it is where it's solely, you know, the entire focus of this project is on climate it is now being woven into everything so and especially when you're working across all these different disciplines and you're able to pull in uh you know so let's say a, a civil engineer to uh I'm, I'm really exposing my lack of engineering knowledge and and consult and <laughs> more uh consultant consultancy base here but um you know you're pulling in like uh, civil engineers or uh, lighting design and they all are uh, contributing to this one project which spans across multiple disciplines but has that climate focus and i think that that's something that i'm really really interested in uh, and then also to see other people's output so uh, as i i think i touched on this in the last question but everybody's very focused on this because everybody understands what a big issue uh, the climate crisis is and so seeing other people's outputs in the term in the form of like uh, internal webinars that they're giving and presentations or even just like sharing uh, you know articles that they've written or blog posts that they've written uh, yeah I think it's very encouraging and it, it really helps you feel that you know everybody's pulling in the pulling in the same direction when it comes to the uh, climate change and addressing the climate crisis so yeah I think that's what I'd say about what motivates me most yeah it's interesting you touch on the lunch and learns there Tim I think there's one every day about something. And every time I see the title, I'm always thinking, oh, that sounds really amazing. And then I'm thinking, well, I probably need to have some lunch <laughs> as well. Um, so it's just like a competition to see how many of these things you can get along to and listen to the brilliant projects that are going on. Uh, Lewis, um, same question to you, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with all points. Uh, I think the obvious one that ob motivates me the most, it's obviously combining work with a purpose. So climate at the end of the day is about people. And I think engineering is to change people's lives. We do engineering, we do projects, we do we're building infrastructure to change people's lives and improve people's lives in a socially just way. I think that's the, the purpose of what we do. And people know Arab for that. We have multiple ways. We've been out in the industry for years. You know, we have better way, we have net zero strategy. Uh, this is not new to us. It's in our core value. So that's the obvious one. If I could mention something that is not obvious perhaps to people in the call that motivates me the most is it's the ability, I think, to influence the industry, especially being in the infrastructure and the built environment sectors. I think being an Arab puts you in a position that you can set the basis of what is going to be considered best practice in the climate world, for example, because many of these sectors are still, you know, early steps in the early steps of their the wider plan to meet big targets. It's a, it's a big task. It's a global task. It requires global effort. So um, being an Arab, I think it gives us, us all of us, uh, the influence to, uh, the ability to influence key clients who play a big, a major role to make this climate uh, action happen. So that would be my answer, I think. Thanks, Lewis. That's brilliant. And it's, it's just great listening to all your responses because there's actually loads, isn't there, that motivates us. Um, and we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, COP26 and exhibitions and
co-creating projects and learning over our lunchtime. But I think, you know, when I really sort of strip it back and think about the single thing which, you know, gets me out of bed in the morning over, you know, almost 20 years is that, you know, every time there's a new client brief um, that you read and it's a slightly different take or it's a new type of project completely and you're challenging yourself to think about how, you know, how can we deliver that project in the best way possible? What's going to be the right people to work on that team? Um, you know, that's, I think, what what's really exciting. And then linked to that, seeing what some of the, our colleagues are capable of, things that I just didn't even know were possible that, you know, you start a discussion and someone says, oh, well, let me show you this uh, thing I built last year and it does, you know, this really clever mapping of skills to, um, you, know, uh, you know, green jobs to different actions within a climate action plan or, you know, uses a new Power BI dashboard or these things which I'm not able to do myself, but I just see colleagues doing and it's amazing. And I, and I think the other thing that motivates me as well is I do a lot of my work um, with clients uh, quite early on uh, at the sort of strategy phase, uh, perhaps before, perhaps when we're trying to dream up ideas for projects, but before the projects really start and before they, you know, get implemented properly. And so I often am motivated to think about what happens to the work that I've worked on after I've finished the commission. And, you know, an example of that is that over the last six or so years, I've probably been involved in writing or helping to write 10, 15 city resilience plans around the world, each of which identify the main resilience threats that a city faces. Uh, a lot of them are climate related, of course, um, and then sets out a list of actions the city can take to, to respond to those risks. And that, those actions are essentially projects that will get delivered over one year, five years, six years. But you kind of wonder, well, how, how, are, you, how are they getting on with those? You know, can I go back and see if they're, if they're progressing? Um, and sometimes you do, and you get to reconnect with clients after a few years, and you, you hear stories about how the stuff that you were thinking about has moved along. So that, that's really motivational. Um, okay, um, so that sort of brings us on to the next question. And uh, we'll be a little quicker on this one, I think, because we want to make sure we have lots of time to take questions at the end. Um, but really simple question, the projects that you've worked on that you're most proud of, and uh, Asia, we'll start with you if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I mentioned before, I've been uh, involved in quite a wide range uh, of projects, so both UK and international. Um, so some of them range from designing sustainable drainage networks uh, in London to designing uh, potable water and irrigation systems for uh, an agricultural university in Rwanda, or even more recently, helping to design a, a, a global online toolkit for global climate resilient infrastructure and uh, an educational toolkit for climate resilient highways. So you can see chronologically that the, the kind of style of my work has quite changed uh, to be more climate facing. So I would say my experience so far has been from, you know, early design like, like you, Ben, to detailed design through con to construction and now more recently the kind of advisory and management style. But I do think the one I mentioned before, so the one that stands out the most is probably the Agricultural University project um, that was uh, located in Rwanda. So that one was very unique and a very, very challenging project I faced quite early on in my career, I would say, whereby the the site was located very rural, very remote, uh, meaning there was absolutely no infrastructure there at all. And so as infrastructure designers, what it meant is that we had to uh, design all the infrastructure from scratch and we had to design it all to be self-sufficient. So, for example, all the electricity was powered by a solar farm located elsewhere on the site. All the drinking water and irrigation was sourced from a nearby lake uh, and then treated locally and then returned back into the same lake. So it was really, really cool to see that very early on in my career to, to have a, such a large scale project and seeing circular economy principles being put into that project uh, and nature based solutions uh, and all the stuff we're still talking about now. So I would say that one, uh, despite being the most challenging time wise and uh, the, with the contractor, the, you know, a lot of complications. But I think that was the most rewarding one as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Tim, what were your favourite projects? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, favourite project, um, I think two, but I, I'll just I'll just keep to one. So, probably the one that uh, I think sort of spir start, started my uh, spiral into climate and sustainability within Arab was a project working for a it's local not a spiral, authority. Tim. It's a staircase. <laughs> Good. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, a project working for a local authority uh, in the UK. So they had asked us to do two things. Um, so they'd ask us to first undertake a study uh, looking at all the renewable energy and clean energy opportunities 
uh, within their within their local area or within within the sort of land uh, of within their boundary. Uh, and so, yeah, do a study of you know what's the sort of potential, what's the potential for solar PV, what's the potential for uh, biomass, uh, wind potential. And and so that we we produced like a pretty uh, pretty nice looking Power BI dashboard, and we did that in collaboration with the uh, energy team. So working you know across uh, it was across the planning team, the environment sustainability team, and the energy team. So again, like sort of drawing on the knowledge of different uh, disciplines, which I think is really a, a benefit of being in a company like Arab. Um, and so the second part of that was producing uh, these local planning policies for that authority. So doing a sort of review of what the current legislation is, what the sort of trajectory of the le legislation is, and you know what might be allowed and what might pass through uh, the inspector and get adopted into the local plan. Um, and again, that's something that you have like a huge influence over, and it's really sort of up to you to decide how far you want to take it. You know, you can you can uh, really delve into this project and really get a f solid understanding. Um, and and yes, we uh, ultimately suggested uh, our own. We suggested uh, planning policies to the local authority um, for them to take forward and adopt into the local plan. So yeah, that that sort of shows like the influence. I think that's that's probably why it, it felt like the best project that I worked on because it really is an opportunity to yeah show it, show influence and hopefully set the sort of best practice standard. Um, so that's probably my favourite project uh, that I can that I can touch on. Yeah, I think I've read that report, Tim, and you worked with Jen. I think it was a fantastic yes, piece of yeah, work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well done on that, um, Lewis. Um, what have you been your favourite projects? Favourite projects. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, so on the adaptation side of thing, I think not only my favourite project is a favourite project for a lot of people there uh, is one a current one called Reconstruction Peru. So it's basically following the devastating loss of lives and livelihoods in in 2017 when there was an El Nino event in Peru. Uh, the UK government signed an agreement with the Peruvian government to basically accelerate the reconstruction of vital schools and health facilities and flood protection schemes in the country to improve, improve its resilience to those uh, extreme events. And we, as a company Arab, are providing international uh, best practice technical assurance role to basically to ensure that this reconstruction is resilient and sustainable, in this, is done in a resilient, sustainable way, and also that it it leaves a legacy to the country. Country, and then we transfer the knowledge that we have in the UK to the proven uh, people, so they can actually do that on their own once the contract is finished. For example, because many of these projects spend over many years, so that's a really interesting project. And I'm mostly working on the development development of a national early warning system for the entire country. So that will affect more than 16 million people who live in the coast, who are exposed to these extreme weather events. So flooding, mass movements, landslides, mudslides. And so they can know, they can prepare, monitor the weather, prepare themselves and essentially reduce the impact of these natural disasters, both in terms of damage, actual damage, financial damage and livelihoods. So, um, yeah, lives and, and saving people's lives, essentially. So it's a really, really inspiring project, and I sh I'm sure many of my colleagues are proud of it. And I think from a mitigation point of view, uh, we're currently working on the update of PASS 2080. So for the infra infrastructure sector, it's a really important. It's the only global standard for carbon management in infrastructure, and it's key if you want to meet the targets we're, we're setting for, for net zero by 20-something, 20 uh, 2050, most of, most of the sectors. Uh, so it basically set out, sets out the principles for the entire infrastructure industry and the built environment to deliver carbon management in their organizations, in their programs, programs of works and projects. So it's a really, really, it, it, it touches on what, what I was mentioning. It's a really big opportunity to influence the entire industry by working at Arab. So those are my favorite ones, I guess, for, now, for the moment. No, Lewis, that's great. And it's also nice to hear you just sort of uh, move between mitigation and adaptation. So, you know, just to, and actually you're talking about Peru, but just this morning I've been reading a report looking at climate risk for a large new development in London, um, where, you know, the, you know, although the, the scale is different and the, and the actual risks um, are slightly different, um, the, you know, that work, that same work is being done by our teams all over the world. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, 
and it's probably worth saying, I'm going to come on to this in a little minute, but you're, you've heard sort of individuals' perspectives from a few people about the types of projects that they work on. The, ro the open roles that we have at the moment are actually quite broad. So yes, you could take a focus on climate adaptation resilience or on net zero um, um, in a climate mit uh, carbon mitigation, uh, but also there's roles open on sustainable development um, as ESG advisors, um, more generally as environmental consultants, ecologists, and so on. Um, and increasingly, our client briefs are requiring us to connect up between these disciplines. Um, I see some questions already coming in around um, some of the challenges our clients are, some of our challenges with our clients and their projects at the moment. And I think, uh, you know, it's really interesting to see how the worlds of climate change and emission reduction are sort of rapidly colliding with sequestration um, and, um, you know, nature-based solutions. And, you know, that means that we've got to bring specialists together who work um, on carbon inventories, carbon trajectories, uh, with those who people who understand about ecology, different tree species, different uh, rates of carbon sequestration from trees, and so on. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that we're, we're obviously just four people in a very big organisation. There's quite a breadth of the different sort of projects that you're able to take on if you join our firm. Um, just for me, um, the projects that I've enjoyed, I, I'm I have, I'm in a fortunate position, or I have been for the last few years, uh, where I've managed Arrow's partnership with C40 Cities. Uh, which I'm proud of. Um, I think it's a great network, 94 mega cities around the world. And Arup invests some of our own funds in supporting a partnership with C40 City so that we can take forward research projects together. And I've been involved in a few of those and I'm really quite proud of the output. So uh, one of them is called Consumption Based Emissions in a 1.5 degree world. Uh, that was published in 2019. And just this year, or late last year, sorry, we, we published um, a new report called Green and Thriving Neighbourhoods, which is like a a blueprint for a, a zero carbon and thriving uh, neighborhood scale uh, and that could be a new de new development or it could be a regeneration of an existing place as well so i'm proud of those um, i was really happy i mentioned earlier about some of the resilient strategies that i've worked on and you know it's a great privilege to travel um, but ultimately i'm a londoner and working on the london one was a real thrill for me um, and tim mentioned the virtual cities exhibition uh, that we did at cop 26 so what we did there was we showcased really inspiring examples of climate action from uh, 11 cities in the C40 network through a virtual platform that we have in Arab called Virtual Engage. So if you are interested, you can type into Google, I don't know, Arab C40 Virtual Cities Exhibition, and you'll find this platform. You can search around there and you can see projects um, that are both about uh, decarbonization, decarbonizing transport, it could be about nature-based solutions, um, uh, could be about building retrofits. There's a range of different types of climate action projects, um, and you can see examples of them from cities around the world. And, and I think actually, for those of you who might have written anything down or, or remembered what people said, I think all of these projects we've been talking about, they all kind of have a place on Arab.com, so you can search um, and find out more information about them there. So um, last question then, and we'll quick fire round. Um, we've obviously been talking about our experiences since we've been in Arab, but what excites you about the future? And um, if I could come to Tim first, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I guess to sort of bring it full, full circle, it'd be the continued flexibility and the ability to sort of carve a way that you carve your own sort of career. Um, so uh, as Ben briefly touched on at the start of the call, I uh, am looking to do a long-term assignment to South Africa. So I mentioned this time my line manager uh, in my most recent appraisal and uh, Two days later, uh, I got a call from somebody in the South Africa region, um, basically saying, "You know, can we set up a call so then we can talk about how this might happen?" Which so went very quickly from a uh, you know a sort of pipe dream to um, you know something that might very might happen very quickly. So I think it's just uh, you know sort of tap pushing on doors and just seeing what uh, what it will uh, what will open ahead of you. I think it's that's definitely it. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll uh, take a trip to Rwanda and go see Aisha's <laughs> handiwork out there as well. Great. Lewis? Um, I think very briefly what excites me the most is the chance of combining business opportunity with career opportunity. So the climate world is a really big hot topic at the moment, but in the infrastructure sectors, as I mentioned, in the built environment, things are still early stages in some ways. So I think this is a great opportunity to combine, you know, creating new, new services for our clients, but at the same time, bringing the skills that I have that are well recognized in Arab, you know, 
to meet the challenge. So I think it's a chance of combining the two that really excites me the most. I'll be brief. That's it. No, that's great. And I think mine would be similar to Tim's, really, that, that you know, that people may have read. Um, oh, I should say, by the way, since we're on a recruitment call, that last yesterday we found out that we have won an award. We are Britain's most admired company, as voted for by um, the rest of the industry, some of our competitors and, and real critics. So that was a nice thing and, and quite nice timing for this call as well, I thought. Um, sorted that out for us. But I agree with you, Tim. I mean, I'm really enjoying the future flexibility. It might just be about um, the sort of stage I'm at li in life at the moment with young children. It's kind of easier for me to work at home. Um, I really am excited about getting back to the office, but I'm not sure I want to go back to the office full time, having had, you know, experience of being at home as I have been for the last couple of years. So trying to find a new balance is, is exciting. Arab has a program called Work Unbound. Uh, and it's you know, it's been quite well publicised in the newspapers. It's quite an, an, a sort of novel and new scheme, I think. It basically, you're contracted to work a certain number of hours in the week. You can work them when you like, providing you don't let down your clients or your colleagues. Um, and so that, you just, you know, for those of us who, who have to suddenly run out in the middle of the afternoon to pick up kids or whatever we have to do, it just, it, it does take a sort of bit of weight off your mind. You can catch up if you need to some other time. It's, it's, quite, it's quite flexible and also not just in terms of time, but also where you are, as Lewis, you're demonstrating by being on this call from Brazil. Um, so, yeah, I think that would be um, some of the things I would mention as, as well. Um, I'm noticing we're getting loads, we're getting a few questions through from the people who are watching this, which is great. Um, so it'd be great just to run through a few of those with all of you. And of course, we'll have different perspectives uh, depending on our conversations that we're having at the moment. But first question that's come in is, what is Arrow's biggest challenges with clients regards to sustainability at the moment? So maybe what I will do is let you guys have a little think about that for a second or two. Well, I'm thinking, uh, go on. you want Aisha to, uh, think, I'm not sure if Aisha answered the question. <laughs> oh, about, well, it, we'll, we'll give it a, Aisha some air time on the, on the questions. Why not? <laughs> yeah. um, keep, well, let's keep ourselves on schedule. We don't want to keep e e e people late. Uh, tonight. Yeah, sure. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think for, my, for, the, for the conversations I'm in at the moment, uh, so I do, as I said before, quite a lot of climate action plans, helping cities or organisations plan how they're going to get to net zero. G getting all the way to zero is quite a challenge for a lot of organisations, and so often there's a gap, and that is often, um, you know, although we ov obviously always pr prioritise reduction over offsetting, there is a conversation about um, how you offset the residual emissions. And I, I think this is a really interesting area that's hotting up um, because organisations like Arab corporates but also local authorities are thinking that they are going to need to purchase some offsets to, to deliver on their commitments and they're not quite sure where they should get them from, how much they should pay for them, what the right sort of verification is for those offsets. So I would say, and I'd be really interested to hear all of your uh, views, that that's a particular challenge that I've had from a four or five different clients within the last few weeks. So I know that it's a bit of a hot topic for people. Um, and, you know, you've probably seen it in the newspapers as well. You know, there's organizations um, thinking about how they create more local offsets through perhaps buying some land elsewhere for some eco sequestration tree planting schemes or, um, you know, as we were recently talking about with a, with a city um, client, you know, potential uh, ways for sequestering um, carbon through direct air capture on buildings, on, 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 on facades, for example. But Aisha, I'll come to you first since I skipped you before. Sorry for that. No, um, it's fine. But um, have, have you, can you think of a challenge um, that any of your clients have got at the moment? Yeah, I was actually just about to echo what you were saying. So more recently, uh, in, in fact, Tim and I were working together on uh, Arab's new regenerative land management team. And, you know, we're having conversations with clients uh, and landowners in, in particular who own a plot of land and traditionally to maximize revenue you know you would build a block of flats or or you know make a kind of mixed use uh, development and so we're I think the shift is going to be quite apparent soon in trying to convince clients that actually what else could you do with this piece of land you know you've got your net zero or biodiversity net gain targets for you know x 2035 or 2050 or whatever how are you going to meet that um rather than buying, you know, buying carbon credits and the prices of that is going to, you know, fluctuate in the future. Have you considered nature-based solutions? Have you considered uh, perhaps a wetland or, a, you know, rewilding this area? So I think 
um, that is going to be kind of our main challenge in getting clients to shift their mindset. Um, but that also couples with my previous answer and that is what is I'm also what I'm most excited <laughs> about as well. So hit two birds there. <laughs> Good on you for getting that one in. Um, okay, well, well, let's um, keep moving through the questions, although I know everyone has another chance to answer that one, but um, there's quite a few coming in and we, we need to we'll see if we can get through as many as we can before the time is up. Um, the next question is interesting as well. It's, how has those challenges changed um, in the last five years? So my quick response would be that five years ago, we were much more in the planning sp space. We we're doing a lot of analysis about what it would take to get to zero carbon, what sort of projects would have to be delivered and by whom. But we're now, I think, much more, it's getting much more real. We're talking about how we finance those projects, um, how we set up project management offices to make them happen. Um, so I would say that we're, We've seen a shift, um, you know, not, not with everybody. Of course, everybody's at slightly different stages on this curve, but we've seen a general shift from, you know, very early analysis and planning through to let's get on and implement. Uh, but Tim, um, uh, what thoughts have you got on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, last five years, I'll, I'll get off my uh, limited understanding uh, as, as a uh, placement student five years ago. But I think what I saw very quickly is that things are, are, I mean, obviously the biggest challenge, and I think that part of the reason that we're we're facing this uh, crisis is that we are prioritizing, you know, cost and uh, yeah, cost above above all other things, and like time scales. Um, so when you have a project and it needs to meet certain deadlines within a certain budget, that's when the sort of sustainability question gets gets ignored, and that's uh, I think that's sort of contributed to why why we're uh, we're in the in the climate crisis now. Um, and I think that clients are becoming more aware of this and especially starting to understand their remit a bit more. So starting to understand that they actually sit within, you know, a system or within a network that has the power to really sort of make an impact. Um, so, yeah, in terms of challenges, challenges changing, I think that, that that's, that's still an ch ongoing challenge is, is, you know, proving that cost, short term cost um, should not be favored over the sort of long term addressing addressing these long term climate problems uh, i think that's that's one that's going to continue to be a challenge but in, you know encouragingly i think clients are uh, clients are understanding that they have increased remit to sort of influence and and sort of set the set a sort of signal to the rest of the market yeah that's thanks tim that's fantastic and I realise that we're not going in full rounds um, with each question, but um, maybe Lewis, um, I might put the next one to you if that's all right. So what would you say Arab does in terms of sustainability within the company, which might differentiate from us from some of our competitors? Okay. Um, so I think three things could differentiate us from our competitors. So I think the first thing is something that we've mentioned already, which is, you are open to shape your career the way you want in the company. And that's really important in the climate world because it's such a big topic. It's a broad topic. So at some point you might be need, you know, maybe focus as started, for example, in the master planning side of thing where it was looking at only the sustainability strategy of it, but I developed an, an interest for resilience. So I contact the resilience uh, shift team and then got involved in some, some of that, that work. And then I got, I, developed that interest in the mitigation side of things. So I'd reach out to the people who usually lead the net zero strategies, the carbon management side of things. So it's it's really open for you to shape the way you want your career. And it actually encourages you to do that because we understand that a good professional needs to have this, you know, multidisciplinary and, you know, good exposure to different areas to be a good climate professional, I think. Second, we do provide a lot of upskilling uh, training uh, for our staff. That's a really important, big one for us. And we have the Invest in Arabs, which are research funds. In case you have a big question for a project or for a specific for your sector, you can apply for a fund and do and develop that research or develop a tool. I've done that, develop a carbon tool out of that pot of money. And then thirdly, uh, it's a really important one, but it's soft. It's collaboration. I've mentioned this already, and climate requires collaboration. Collaboration. It's a multidisciplinary. It's a global problem, so it, it it requires a global effort to tackle it. So I would say our it plays to our strength, collaboration. So um, it's it puts us in a really great position when com compared to other other companies. 
Thanks, Lewis. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I think there's a, I think there's a few different things that we do um, which may differentiate ourselves. I think you know, at a very top level, we have a corporate sustainability strategy called A Better Way, which is setting the framework for everything that we do um, uh, in our company across the board. Um, that's, we also have a net zero strategy by 2030 for how we're going to reduce our own corporate emissions. Um, uh, within that, we have a fund um, which people can apply for, uh, apply to, sorry, uh, to do projects that help reduce carbon emissions. Um, also at the sort of global top down, you know, the top level, um, you know, we made, we made some pretty bold commitments on climate change through the COP26 event. So we, we, and these are available publicly on the, on, on the web. Um, we committed that we would from April start to back away from uh, fossil fuel projects. And we committed to um, doing a whole life carbon assessment on every project that we're involved in and share and, and, and collecting that, those results so that we can gain insights from that. Um, so I think that, so there's quite a lot of sort of, um, you know, bold commitments that our leadership have made, which are setting the direction for everybody in the firm. But there's also, I think, you know, there's ways that individuals can get involved at their own office level as well. We have a program called Overgreen, which is about inspiring uh, action within the office community in each of the different offices. So recently, for example, I was talking to the guy, uh, Mark, who runs the Birmingham office, and there they have a really great initiative, which is, um, you know, using a third party app to encourage uh, colleagues to find out uh, where they live uh, close to each other in a street so they can share lifts so they don't have to have too many cars moving around. So, you know, there's all sorts of these localized initiatives, um, which I think are really good as well. So, yeah, I think to that question, there's quite a range of different. But I shouldn't talk too long because we're getting close to time and we've got a few questions here. I think maybe we'll just have a go at one more before we bring it to an end. Um, uh, oh, here's a good one. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't manage to get through all the questions on the session. There were a few that we've missed, but um, uh, yeah, I think we've offered people the opportunity to have a one-to-one -one conversation. So there's always a chance to find a bit more out if you're if you're still interested. Um, but could you uh, share your experience regarding internal uh, training or workshops that you've had the opportunity to attend at Arab? So I guess learning opportunities. Um, and Aisha, I'll come to you first if that's okay. Yeah, sure. So um, I've been at Arab about five years now. So I've had uh, quite a bit of diverse training over the years. So a lot, you know, goes from health and safety, uh, sustainability, technical design work, you know, using AutoCAD and using uh, Bentley software. So ranges from very technical uh, to more softer skills, so presentation skills or how to write an effective report. And all of those have essentially come from me asking to do those. Um, not all of those are mandatory. Um, so it just comes from my personal interest saying this is an area I really want to improve on. Can I can I take this course? Um, and nobody's ever really said no to this day, which is great. Um, and also in terms in terms of um, training on the job, like I said earlier, the whole, um, you know, I spent a year working on a construction site, which is something I have never done before. I never thought I would do, actually. Uh, and that came from, you know, me asking to do that. And I gained a lot um, of valuable contacts and valuable lessons from that. So, um, yeah, I think both on the job and formal training, there's a nice kind of mix um, that I've been able to, that I've been exposed to, really. Thank, thank you. That's that's brilliant, uh, Tim. Same question. Yeah, sure. Um, so, internal training, I think like it's broadly formal and informal. So. Uh, for the sort of formal training where, where it may be held by your uh, chartership, in my case, it's the Royal Town Planning Institute. So that's all paid for as well as uh, membership. Um, so, yeah, again, you're just sort of you're very much encouraged to go out and look for the opportunities for like external training or and um, and just sort of sign up for it. And and uh, as Aisha says, I've not been uh, not been turned down yet, which is great. Um, and then the more info more informal stuff, I guess would be the sort of internal webinars that are going on. Uh, there's there's always some something to attend, you know, where, where it's like an hour slot where they're explaining, for example, the uh, update to PAS 28 that uh, Louise was men were mentioning. Um, and there's also a lot of guidance that's available through the, the skills networks. So skills uh, networks, which are sort of directed at, uh, so you, you say you have a landscape arch architecture skills network, or you have an environmental and ecology skills network. and within this people have produced guidance again through that uh, initiative where you can um, use uh, Arab funds to pursue your own interests and people have 
done all this sort of research and like consolidated it and shared it. Um, so yeah, like informally and formally, I think you're very much encouraged to go out and and uh, do this. And I'm actually working on a on producing a training uh, course for the uh, Construction Innovation Hub's value, value Toolkit right now. So uh, as well as attending training, there's also opportunities to uh, to give it, which is very interesting. Yeah, that's great, Tim. And, and Lewis, if it's okay, I'm going to skip um, over you because uh, I want to close on time. Um, but yeah, I agree. And I guess um, there's also quite a lot of softer, softer training. So I've, I've been having some coaching re recently where I get lots of feedback about things I might be good at and things I'm not so good at and where I have to work on things. Um, that's just fantastic that we've got that sort of culture where uh, that sort of stuff is done in a quite open way and, um, and you know, it gives you a chance to reflect on the areas that you can um, improve on. Um, so nearly at time, if anyone is still hanging on the line, I really hope you are. Um, thank you so much again for joining. Um, I hope the chat has been sort of informative in terms of your, you know, getting a bit sort of firsthand, um, ideas of what it's like, the types of projects that we get exposed to. Um, and you know, thanks very much to the panelists, uh, Tim, to Aisha, to Lewis for giving up their time as well to come along this evening and just talk to all of you. Um, so as I said earlier on in the call, we, we do have a wide range of opportunities available. So sustainability, climate change, environmental impact assessment, ESG, resource and waste. We have a you know, need for more environmental consultants, sustainability engineers, open roles for senior civil engineers and for resilient infrastructure and ecologists also. Um, so quite a lot of open roles. Uh, if you have enjoyed the session or liked any of what you heard or you just want to know more, um, then please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, first of all, uh, you can visit the careers page and you can look at all these open opportunities. Um, and the team here who are on the call with us have just posted a link so that you can click on that and access all the opportunities. Have a look through there. Please um, you know, do apply um, and do take up the opportunity where you can to, to get in touch with people that you may know through LinkedIn or whatever other means you have. Um, of chatting to people who, who are here at Arapa already who can tell you a little bit more about what it's like. Um, as I said at the start of the call, we've got um, a need for a lot more people. Uh, we're really looking to attract some fantastic uh, new applications. So please um, do apply. Thanks so much for joining and have a fantastic rest of the evening. Thanks a lot. Bye.